I went to space camp seven times while I was growing up. I really wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, each one of those camps, they would train you on these full-scale simulators like this, and at the end of the camp, they had a 24-hour mission, and everyone was assigned a role. You were either on the space shuttle or on the ground, and during that mission, you had to stay in character the whole time, and they would throw these realistic anomalies at you, and you had to solve problems, and it was the most amazing experience for a kid like me. Uh, at, at the camp, they had a domed IMAX theater, and throughout the camp session, they would show space-themed movies. And my personal favorite was called The Dream is Alive. And this was narrated by Walter Cronkite. This was the inspirational story of going to space aboard the space shuttle. And it ended with this dramatic scene. Floating free, we look back at the majestic panorama of Earth, our home. Even as a young kid, that stirred me emotionally. I so longed to see that view for myself. Growing up, each one of us has our space camp. Think back now to what you loved as a kid. What brought you true joy? But somehow, as we grow up, we get older, we get jobs and responsibilities, the real world gets in the way, and we tend to forget about our space camps. We forget how to live our dreams. I'm a mechanical engineer now, but I started my education out at Purdue University intending to study aerospace engineering on my way to becoming an astronaut. You see, I specifically chose Purdue because more astronauts have come out of Purdue than any other public institution, most famously among them, Neil Armstrong. And while I was at Purdue, I let myself get redirected by that real world to a practical discipline of mechanical engineering. And I've been very satisfied with being a mechanical engineer, but not long after I graduated, I had a lingering desire to get back to that thing that I love, that space that I love so much. And so I started flying model rockets. This was something I had done as a little kid. And uh, when I got back into rocketry, what I discovered was that while I was away and growing up at college, rockets had been growing up also. And gone were the days of little rockets made of, out of balsa and plywood and cardboard. Now rockets were being made out of carbon fiber and aluminum to bear the extreme loads. They'd gotten much bigger in size, and now the electronics were sophisticated. They had onboard altimeters and accelerometers. They could measure all kinds of things. And the rocket motors themselves were much more powerful now, generating hundreds of pounds of thrust, sending these rockets at, at incredibly high speeds up to high altitudes. Here I am with, with one of my carbon fiber creations, demonstrating some of the different exhaust effects that, that rocket motors could possibly make. And as I continued in the hobby, things kept getting bigger. And for me, this was kind of the challenge. And this rocket actually was big enough that I had to use a cluster of three rocket motor engines to get this off the ground. And then things got ridiculous. <laughs> and no, that's not Photoshop. That rocket really is that big. Uh, and, and when it gets to this level, you have to make the rocket motor. You have to make the propellant. You have to make every single part of it, because these are custom creations. And so what's the difference? This is the evolution that takes you from hobby rocketry or model rocketry into what we call high power rocketry and then into amateur rocketry. And amateur rocketry, the word amateur to some people may mean something that's being done at a lesser level, an amateur level, but for me, it has a much different meaning. Let's look at the definition of the word amateur. An amateur is somebody who engages in something for pleasure. And if you look at the root of the words amateur, it comes from amor or amore, which means love or lover. People who are amateurs do something because they love it. I'm an amateur rocketeer. I love rockets. I've been flying rockets now for about 20 years, and during that time I've flown hundreds of flights, mostly successful, some not, uh, and I've watched thousands of other people's flights. And I can remember back in the earliest days of rockets, I'd be standing in a field waiting for one of my rockets to launch, and a mere second after the rocket would take off, I would realize I forgot to do something. I didn't arm the electronics or connect the parachute or whatever it was, and the rocket would have a problem. So I started this visualization exercise where I would close my eyes, picture the rocket launching, and think through everything that could or would happen. And a lot of times, that, that visualization, seeing a successful rocket launch in my mind, would lead me to remember things like this, and it would help me to have a more successful flight. And it's kind of like that in life. You know, sometimes we get busy go about going about our lives, and we forget to take that moment, pause, stop, close your eyes, think about where you want to be in life, imagine where you want to go, and there's really no limit to what you can accomplish if you do that, if you have that focus forward towards what you want to do. But there's another little part to it, and it's, it has to do with that will aspect of it. 
you have to, you ha you have to be able to, to drive yourself there. Uh, at the company that I work for now, uh, it's a medical device company, and we have almost exclusively engineers. Pretty much everyone in the organization is an engineer. And you would think that in an organization like this, we would hire just the best and the brightest, the highest GPAs from the best universities. And not exactly. Don't get me wrong. We have some of those people. But when we look at, at new employee hires, we like to look at their extracurricular activities. We like to hire amateurs. If somebody flies model airplanes, builds RC cars, is part of a college Grand Prix race car team, maybe they build fighting robots, or maybe even fly model rockets, those are the kind of people we want. They have hands-on skill. They know how to identify and solve problems for themselves. They understand what it takes to make something. But more than that, they're more than engineers. They have a passion inside of them that drives them forward. They're innovators, builders, makers. They, they're, they're, they're sharing in that love. And I tell you this today because that's the second part. You can do anything if you put your mind to it, you have that focus, but you have that love and that passion that will drive you towards that goal. And this is, this was being, this is the, the third time you're hearing this today. Dre mentioned it, and, and Eduardo mentioned it. You know, and Eduardo had it, a good way of saying it. Dream it, do it. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll, uh, you'll, you can have that, your, your passion and your work converge. And that actually happened for me for a while. So I was working in a field of fire suppression, and I was flying my high power and amateur rockets. And my, my activities actually caught the attention of, 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 of a dear friend of mine, Corey Klein, at Environmental Aeroscience Corporation. And at, at EAC, we like to call it, they, uh, they worked on hybrid propulsion systems. And this was a unique form of rocket motor. It was a combination of a solid and a liquid. So it took some of the best attributes of both of those. And, uh, and, and Corey actually was the guy who invented hybrids. So I had the, the guy, right? The right guy was there with me to teach me. And we learned about rockets. And, and, and hybrid, the hybrids that we worked on were really neat. They were uh, uh, an inert rubber as the fuel and nitrous oxide as the oxidizer. And by using that inert fuel and by only combining those two components at the time that you needed them, you had a, a, the, the safest possible rocket motor system. So we did amazing work. We worked with DARPA, NASA, and the Air Force, doing contract works, doing research. Uh, but our most notable work came as part of a contract to provide propulsion for Burt Rutan and scaled composites as they were building Spaceship One. You see, they were going to compete to try to win the X Prize. And this was a, a venture where they had to put a manned vehicle into space and repeat that twice. And so they, they had chosen hybrids specifically for the reason that they were inherently safe. And so we worked with them, and as a result of that work, we designed, built, and tested the largest nitrous oxide hybrid that had ever been fired at the time. And this was an amazing experience. It was a wonderful time in my life. I was living and working in rockets. But unfortunately, uh, there was a, a follow-on contract with this to provide these fuel grains for their flights. And, and uh, another vendor was chosen, mostly due to geographic considerations, because they were close to the flight facilities. Uh, we did have a lot of our hardware fly, and a lot of our design components made it into Spaceship One. But that, that loss of that contract was a major blow for EAC. But for me, it opened up another door. Uh, I'd been getting contacted by a group of amateurs uh, a team called the Civilian Space Exploration Team. And this was a group of amateurs that had a goal in mind. Their goal was to be able, the first people to put a rocket into space, the first civilians to put a rocket into space. This had never been done before. And they'd made several attempts. They had, they'd probably made four or five attempts by the time they contacted me. And most of the problems they'd had were related to their rocket motor system. And they knew about the rocket motors that I had been building in my amateur uh, rockets, and asked me if I would w be willing to join their team and, and, and some of the other people from EAC. And we joined together and joined that team and built a, a very large model rocket, actually the largest amateur rocket that had been built to date, and took that thing out to the desert and flew it. And it actually flew to 72 miles, making it the first amateur rocket to make it into space. But it was the first civilian rocket, citizens, normal people, not governments. Only, only governments and government institutions had ever put anything into space before that time. In fact, we even beat Bert Rattan, who flew his X-Prize flights only a month later. He even emailed us congratulating us on beating him. And for me, this was a fantastic accomplishment. You know, uh, I was blown away, not just by the record-setting nature of it, but the fact that it was a group of amateurs, other lovers of rockets and space that had banded together, had that singular focus on a goal, 
and had the love and the drive and the passion to push us forward to accomplish that goal. So if you're, if you're lucky like I was and, and you get a chance to, to live and work in your passion, congratulations, that's great for you. Uh, I know that doesn't happen for most of us, uh, but I can guarantee you that out there, whatever your passion is, there's a group of amateurs that shares your passion and they're looking for you to, to join them, to be part of their team and, and to mentor them, and, or maybe to be mentored by them. And, and so if, if you can find that group of amateurs, you'll enrich your own life and the lives of those that you join with. So I was, I was living, uh, I, was, I was working in the, in, in the field of medical uh, devices after, uh, after that Spaceship One contract ended, so did EAC, unfortunately. And um, it, it was a major blow for, for a lot of us, but thankfully, a lot of the principles of EAC moved forward to create a new company uh, called Synthion that was a medical device company. And uh, you th might think, oh, that's kind of an unusual transition from aerospace to medical devices, but it's, it's pretty smooth. A lot of the materials and design requirements are very similar and it crosses over nicely. Uh, so I was working in the field of medical devices for four or five years, and I kind of felt that longing to get back to, to rockets. And in 2011, John Carmack, the inventor of the video game Doom, uh, who is, is a space enthusiast, and he banded together with a bunch of other space enthusiasts, and they together offered a challenge. They would give a $10,000 prize to anybody who could put a rocket over 100,000 feet and get it back with GPS data. And I thought, that's it. That's the inspiration I needed. That was something that I'd wanted to do for a long time to get a, a high altitude flight, and, uh, and so this was the time. This was my chance. So in uh, in in 2011, this was in mid-2011, and in, over the 4th of July holiday, I sat down and started designing a rocket and used uh, SolidWorks and a number of other simulation programs and analyzed the rocket motor, the aerodynamics, the loads, the drag, all the different aspects of the rocket, and, uh, and, and had this design all laid out. And oh, I needed a place to fly it. Um, rockets like this, there's not a lot of places to fly something to these kind of altitudes. And there's a national club called the Tripoli Rocketry Association that sponsors uh, high power and amateur rocketry activities throughout the country. They have uh, chapters of their organization where they coordinate launches and launch sites, and nearly every weekend they will launch somewhere. And usually they have clearance from the FAA to fly between five to 25,000 feet. Uh, but once a year, they host a special event in the Black Rock Desert in Nevada where they have clearance from the FAA to fly to 100,000 feet. And so that's the perfect venue for this, but by definition, I needed to exceed their waiver. So I had to get a special waiver known as a class three waiver uh, from the FAA. So I put all that design work that I had together, submitted a package to the FAA, and, uh, and by, by the end of July, I had a, a response from them. And they, the, they had approved my flight. And I decided to name my project Quake. And this was in homage to John Carmack's video game that followed on to Doom that was known as Quake. Also, the eight represented the eight inch diameter of the rocket itself, and then the Q is the motor designator. So if you did fly SD's rockets, you might remember they have the A, B, and C engines, and then the mighty D, and uh, each letter represents a doubling in total power from the previous letter. So you can imagine that by the time you get to Q in the alphabet, you're talking about a pretty big rocket motor. And uh, the, the rocket motor in Quake actually was equivalent to 7,000 SD's D motors. So th this is accomplished through using a composite propellant that's more than twice as powerful as that found in the SDs. In fact, my propellant formula is extremely similar to what the Space Shuttle solid rocket boosters use. So when, when you go to design and, and build a rocket like this, there's a lot of different components to it. You have to design the fin can and uh, the, the recovery system, the avionics, and all the structures, and the rocket motor itself. And, uh, and, and that would that's a... a quite a challenge. There's a lot of work to be done there. And so when I sat down to look at, could, it, could I even get this done in time? Because that, that national launch that happens in the, in the desert happens in the end of September. And I only had about two months to go. And I thought, yeah, I, could, I can do this, but I'm going to need help. So I reached out to my employer. They offered machining services. And I had a number of friends, wonderful friends, that stepped up to offer their time and efforts and financial resources. And of course, I had that critical support, that of my wife. So now I was free to commit myself wholeheartedly to the project. And uh, so when, when you go to do a project like this, you're going out to the Black Rock Desert in the middle of nowhere. And uh, when, when you do that, you, you, you have to bring everything with you. And that includes the launch tower. So uh, I had other friends step up to help design and build a tower that was strong enough to be able to, to, to support the loads of a rocket like this, but then would be collapsible to be transportable out to the desert. 
Uh, and so as I was planning this flight, I started using that visualization technique. And I thought through every phase of the flight, everything that could or would go and happen on the flight. And I pictured this, this successful flight. And every time I found something that looked like it might be a risk, something that seemed a little dangerous, a little bit on the edge, I'd start doing testing and figure out ways to, to mitigate that risk and make it a safer flight. Uh, one of the things that was really, really important for me was getting video from on board the flight. So I designed this video package uh, that had two GoPro cameras and a Flip HD. This was the earliest days of GoPros. So these were first generation GoPros. And if I could get video back from, a ro from the rocket, then in, in some way that would be how I could project myself into the rocket and, and live that dream of going to space. The final challenge in a project like this is getting it there. Right, so we're in Miami, we're trying to go to Nevada, and I don't have time to tell you the stories. Uh, if you want, come see me after, I'll be out there, and there's gonna be, there's a, a, it, was a, it was an extreme challenge to get out there. But uh, by September 28th, Thursday, we were finally arrived on the playa of the Black Rock Desert with that tower and the rocket and all the parts, and we started building that tower. And by 8 p.m., the tower was done, but there was no time to rest. I had to keep working. Uh, I wanted to get the vehicle ready to launch because Friday was set to be the first day of the launch, the first day of my Class 3 waiver, and it was the best weather of the event. So it's critical for me that we fly on Friday. So my team committed to, to continue working on the rocket. And 10 p.m. turned into 3 a.m., turned into 6 a.m., and as the sun rose, only love and that adrenaline were keeping me going. And on September 30th, 2011, under a clear blue sky, years of dreaming and months of preparation were put to the test as Quake launched. Four, three, two, one, and launch. Here we go. Above 99% of the atmosphere, that clear blue sky turns into the blackness of space. Floating nearly weightless, Quake's recovery system would deploy. and gravity would slowly begin to pull the rocket down to Earth. But at this altitude, there's no air, so the rocket would fall increasingly faster, reaching a peak velocity on the way down of over 600 miles an hour, falling towards Earth. But as it hit the lower atmosphere, it would start to catch air into the parachute and slow down, and it touched down on the desert floor only 3.2 miles from the launch point. The flight was a complete success. And through this video, thank you. Through this video, I was able to take that journey and now to share that journey with you. My dream was and is alive. So here's my challenge to you today. Be an amateur in the best way possible. Pursue your dreams with love. Rekindle what made you love the world when you were younger. Share your passion with others. Find the other amateurs of the world and live your dreams together. Go build your rocket. Thank you.
Thank you.